just a moment. Um, we are kind of at room capacity. I really don't want to have to like um, <laughs> say no to people. I'm going to ask, there, should, there might be a door wedge or there, that we might be able to have some people sitting outside. We do have to be careful. There is a, um, <laughs> there is a capacity in this room. Um, but I want to thank you all for, for coming on in. Um, and there's a few more seats here. There's at least one seat up here. If you have a seat, we'll do this like the movie theaters. If you have a seat next to you, raise your hand. Anybody? Um, come on in and sit down. We'll try and squeeze in as many as people as we can. Um, I don't know how to turn the microwave micro microphone on. Can everybody hear me? Oh, there's at least one other seat, couple other seats up right here. Oh, it's on you. Okay, so. All right, there we go. Just want to make sure that um, hearing is not an accessibility issue for anyone. So, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Amy Lannon, and I'm the director here at the Reading Public Library. And um, before we get started, I do just want to go over a few housekeeping details. As I mentioned, this is a, our room is at capacity today. So, um, first, please note that there are some emergency. There's an emergency exit door behind you emergency exit only it will alarm if you go out as well as out here and to the right that would be your quickest exit the restrooms are located out here down and to the left across from the um, elevator and the stairs that you all came in and um, the stairs that you came in is are how you will need to exit the building as long as there's not an emergency um, so I'd also like to give a big thank you to Julie Mercier, um, who organized this event. Um, on top of all the other community projects that are going on around town, a very busy and growing town, Julie has made an exceptional effort um, to bring us all here together um, to listen and discover and ask questions this evening. Also, while this is a um, meeting open to the public and everyone standing or not is, is welcome, um, I'd like to clarify this is not a formal hearing or a board meeting or a committee meeting or any sort of official decision making process. There are, as you can see, a number of folks here. Um, some people will present, some people will ask questions, um, and all of us have this moment and time to listen. Um, and it actually reminded me, I just wanted to take a moment, one of my favorite quotes from Stephen Covey is um, that most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. So to that point, um, and so that we can all really listen and understand each other this evening, uh, please remember to show respect for every speaker, including those who might not have the same perspective or opinions as your own. Um, we have arranged for the Q&A portion of the evening to be moderated in order to help things run smoothly. And we do ask that you work with this process as well as understand that some questions raised this evening may not be able to be answered right now. Um, so this is a, a point of learning. So with all that being said, I'd like to introduce Julie Mercier from the Town of Reading and she's going to make some introductions and get things started this evening. Thank you, Amy, and thank you all for being here. Um, this is a night for discovery for all of us. Um, many of us have never dealt with a situation like this before. Um, we're all interested in knowing more about what's proposed and what, if any, processes will apply. Town staff are here to help facilitate the discussion. We're not here to advocate for one use over another. Um, and town council is here to help us all understand the legal landscape that may or may not apply, um, depending on what the situation is. So the structure that we have envisioned for tonight is as follows. Um, actually, first let me introduce these, these people right here. Um, so um, from the staff side, there's me, community development director. We also have town manager Bob Lashore over um, by the door. We have Erica McNamara from Arcasa. Um, actually, I think it's just Reading uh, Coalition at this point. Um, Amy Lannon, library director, you've already met. Um, we, we have Chris Heap from town council standing um, at the door with the yellow tie. And here at the table um, from uh, your right to left at the very end down there, I believe is attorney Andrew Tyne, and then um, Dan Botwinick, who's the property owner, Maureen Kavanaugh, um, Process Recovery Center, or some other affiliation, um, Nicole White, and Justin Etlin from the Process Recovery Center. So 
Um, the structure that we have envisioned for tonight is a brief presentation and an overview of the Process Recovery Center and what our residential program is um, by Nicole and Justin. And then a Q&A session, which will be moderated by Select Board Chair Vanessa Alvarado. Um, so during the Q&A session, we ask that you be direct, courteous, and as brief as possible. We have a lot of people in the room, and um, I'm sure with a lot of questions and a lot of opinions and things to say. So we want to make sure we have time for everybody. So if you've already spoken, um, please refrain from speaking a second time unless, um, until, unless and until everyone <coughs> has been you know, able to speak, or if you are the one of the designated neighborhood liaisons, then you know, obviously that mic doesn't apply to you. Um, please not try not to interrupt. Um, try to keep the discourse civil and refrain from using language that is accusatory, conspiratorial, or disrespectful. And just as a heads up, we have a hard stop here at the library. They kick us out at nine o'clock. So, thank you very much. And with that, I turn it over to Vanessa Alvarado. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming this tonight. Uh, again, my name is Vanessa Alvarado. I'm the chair of the Reading Select Board. Um, before we get to the Q&A portion, um, I did want to turn it over to um, Justin and Maureen, is it? Uh, Nicole. Nicole. I'm Nicole. mainly going to present. What was that? It's mainly going to be me. Main All right. Um, so we'll be hearing from Justin. Um, the brief presentation may answer some questions that some of you may have, uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Cool. Thank you. Is this, does this work? Does it work? Um, it's not. It's not amplifying. That's. I can. Um. Let me stand up. Hi. So I'm Justin Edling. I'm a managing partner at the Process Recovery Center. I want to thank everybody for coming. It's great to see everybody invested in the writing community. Um, so the Process Recovery Center is a licensed drug and alcohol treatment center in Nashua, New Hampshire. We've been around for five years. I'm sure some people have looked us up at this point, but if you haven't, feel free. Um, so we provide drug and alcohol services to people who are continuing treatment. So the main thing that we're here is to answer your questions and concerns about what we're planning on doing with 59 Middlesex. So the plan with 59 Middlesex would it for, is for it to be a residential treatment center. So what that looks like, not everybody it's not a sober house, just to be clear. Our plans with the building would to be licensed by the Alcohol and Drug Bureau in Massachusetts, which has already been approved for, and we would have licensed staff there 24-7, minimum of four staff. So if we have doctors, we have nurses, and people are continuing care. It's a step-down care. So people go to detox first when they're withdrawing from drug and alcohol abuse, and then they choose to go to residential treatment. They can choose to go home if they want to, but it's a choice for them to go to residential treatment. So everybody coming to the treatment center is going to be choosing to come there. They're not forced to come there. We don't have anybody paroling from there. It's mainly private insurance. We are required to take some people with mass health, which we will be doing. Um, and normally they stay between three and four weeks um, and get treatment every day. So they live there. They, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're shaking your head about, but um, it's, yeah, it is unfortunate that people need drug and alcohol treatment, but it's, it's part of our society today. Um, it's, you know, it's a second leading disease taking people's, Americans' lives, just so people in this room know that. Alcohol and drug, drug addiction is the second leading disease. Heart disease leads taking American lives, and drug addiction is second. So I understand people's concerns about this for the safety of their community, and we're here to answer any questions about that, but I can, I've been running a drug and alcohol treatment center for five years, and we've never really had any major issues. So I understand people's concerns, but I feel like some of them are unwarranted, and it's fear that isn't fully justified, because the people that are coming for treatment are not actively using. So thinking of someone who's actively using is not a good representation of someone who's seeking treatment trying to get better. Um, but I think, I think with that, we'll open it up to questions, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of them. <coughs> Thank you, Justin, 
for that overview. Um, before we get into the public comment question or question portion, um, Justin, I was hoping you could clarify something for me sure. since um, the concept of sober homes or um, recovery facilities is new to many of us. Yep. Could you explain the different types of facilities briefly, either that um, you offer or that generally are known to the public so we can differentiate what type of services are offered? Um, sure. Um, so to clarify, we have two sets of microphones here. We have these which go to RCTV and these which go to this audience. Okay, no problem. So you want to know the difference between a sober home and licensed alcohol and drug treatment center? If you would. Sure. So a sober home is unlicensed, normally has a house manager who manages people who are, have finished treatment and they're going to live in a sober house. So normally there's a house manager that manages the people in the house and there's drug testing and, and some other regulations about them going to meetings, but there's no licensed staff there, just to be clear. That is not what we're proposing with 59 Middlesex. We're proposing a licensed drug and al alcohol treatment center. So there will be doctors, nurses, technicians, 24 seven supervision of minimum of four staff at all times, just to be clear. So there's a big difference between a sober house, um, which is not what we're here proposing, um, and a licensed alcohol and drug treatment center. So the people do live there, but they live under medical care, essentially. And they get treatment every day while they're receiving medical care. They get counseling, there's drug counselors, and so they're not leaving the premises, they stay on the premises, and they receive treatment on a daily basis. So that's ultimately the difference. Great, thank you. And then one last question for me. Um, how many patients do you anticipate being in the facility? We anticipate about 24 patients living in the facility. Great, thank you very much. All right, um, we'll open it up to public comment now. Um, there's a lot of people in the room. We wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. So by a show of hands, can you um, please raise your hand to indicate if you have a question or a statement that you'd like to make? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Amy, I'll open it up to you. Yeah, you can just take the mic. Hi, thank you all for coming here tonight. I apologize that I have a, a really raspy throat. <coughs> Excuse me, but and can I, you can you please identify yourself when you speak? Thank you. Sure, Amy Nagy. Um, I'm at 43 Grand Street, where I live with my husband and three children. Um, so we're around the corner. Um, the first thing I want to say is thank you for coming here to talk to us. I'm getting. I'm already getting this like huge. Uh, tension that's mounting and I, I can see it and I don't want you to um, join our community that way. Go ahead, were you going to say something? No, no, I get, uh, I get it. I get yeah, it. Um, but there's a few things that we want to understand. So first of all, it has been very unclear, especially with the communication between the two lawyers, what is even going there. This is the first time I think anyone in the room has heard what the intended use is. Um, and there's still a lot of questions about regulation and what the um, neighborhood can look for. This isn't really just a neighborhood issue for us. This is a town issue. You're not from here, so I, I, I totally get that you don't understand that this beautiful library that we've been in has been a hard-fought battle, years of construction, $19 million worth of taxpayers money. And I think the knee-jerk reaction is, if that was going to be a sober home, what would happen to our town center, which is this, um, this facility? I want to get rid of the elephant in the room for a minute. Like, I, I commend you for working with people who need substance abuse guidance, um, who need help with that. I think every single person in this room has dealt with it or dealt with someone who has dealt with it. So we understand this is an epidemic. It's not just happening to Middlesex Street. This is happening throughout the country, throughout the state, throughout the town. And we are not saying that people who need substance abuse um, help and guidance aren't worthy of being here, aren't worthy of being our neighbors. But I think we've set off on a really, really bad tone so far with the communication between um, <clears throat> Attorney Tyne and our um, own lawyers with a little bit, and Cougar, with a little bit of the, the tap dancing you've done with not being so clear about what exactly your intended use was. So that's been a little bit hard for the community to swallow. But I think what we immediately are thinking is, is this a done deal? Has the lease been signed? Is this actually happening? Because 
what we keep hearing is it might be this, it might be that, and the letters back and forth are as clear as mud with what exactly you have planned. So I just to like clear that because there's a lot of people here who are don't really trust um, a lot of what's happening in the drug and alcohol community right now because of all the non-regulation and people taking advantage of people who quite frankly need help and are buying beds. Um, so I guess the first thing I would love to know is, is this happening? Is this a real thing? Is, have you signed an agreement? Are you, what are you waiting on from us? So we haven't signed an agreement. I mean, if I'm being completely honest, we haven't signed a lease yet yeah. because we're exploring so having, you know, having the facility here, to be honest, you know? So no, we have we haven't signed the lease yet. We're we're going through the exploratory process. That's why we're here with you all, to be honest, of having the facility here. So we'll just do this back and forth, sure. I guess. So um, what happens if it's not a um, uh, not a nursing facility? I'm sitting down now, I think we'll just um, What happens if it's not a nursing facility? What happens if we decide not to go that way? What, what happens next? So just to be clear, there is, uh, there's not a lease signed. However, there is a letter of intent that they have, uh, the Process Recovery Center has provided me and I'm intending to move forward with them. We're mutually intending to move forward with the stated purpose. Um, the stated purpose being 100% a fully licensed treatment facility with 24-hour staff. So I, I guess you're referring to, and so let me clear just what you're talking about. So we have submitted a couple different things. Yeah. Uh, basically what I would like to do as the owner of the property is to get a certificate of occupancy so that I can derive income from the property. Um, what I prefer to do is allow uh, this group to do exactly what it is that Justin just described, um, and that's what they prefer to do. But if I, if if we can't do that, and that that requires some um, agreement from the town, then I'm going to pursue some other uh, avenue in order Still to get. Still living home. That, that's certainly one of the options. Yeah. It's it's a very likely option that we would pursue. So, um, but I, would it, you know, I'm going to look at all the different things that are available by right. Uh, that may be something that this group um, can do uh, and wants to do. Um, there are other groups that would like to do that. But my goal is to ideally, you know, have good communication with everyone and uh, help these guys get approval for what it is they want to do, which is what Justin described. Okay. So I just want to set the stage. You know why we're all here. I, I can't speak for everyone in this room, but I've been elected the spokesperson of this neighborhood. We're all here because we're very concerned. Um, we know that sober homes are completely unregulated. You can sit here and tell me till you're blue in the face that you are going to do drug testing. You'll only have 20 people there, which is already a huge number. But there's no way that you, there's no, um, regulations, nothing that can stand in your way from doing anything else. So I'm interested in hearing about the nursing facility and understanding like what the what the obstacles are in your way. Because for us in the town, it sounds like a very slippery slope to a sober living facility. And I want to be very clear about something. We are not against sober living facilities, but that's a 27 room, I believe, um, uh, building. And we all know what's happening with unregulated sober living homes. People, you can say, we're going to put 24 in there. If it, there could be 75 people in there. The fire department can't come in. The board of health can't come in. So right now, what's difficult for us is I'd like to know two things. One, what's standing in your way of saying 100% that we, that's what you're doing, that putting in a nurse, a 24-hour monitored nursing facility. And two, if it is a sober living home, have you? Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. I apologize. If it is a nursing facility, um, I'm sorry, if it is a sober living home, um, what are your views on that and the number of residents and and the fact that it's an unregulated in industry with a lot of people who would be living there? So uh, the Process Recovery Center has no intention on opening yeah. a sober living facility there, so I really don't want Sorry, wanna... so it's Cougar who could possibly open Yes, it so... Got it. 
you know, if you, uh, so I mean, you I could, I could talk to you about sober living too. I own sober living. I just, I don't have an intention. We have zero intention of opening a sober living facility. We are not here to deceive anyone. Our intention is to open a licensed drug and alcohol treatment center, residential program. So a couple questions about that. Yep. Um, a few things I'd love to know. And one, I, I feel like nobody is answering my question here, and it's okay. probably not you. It's probably these gentlemen on the end. What is standing in your way from signing the lease and having this done? Well, well that, that is a legal question, so maybe, maybe, yeah, I, I, maybe I re yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, maybe I should respond. I mean, sure. it, it's as simple as they have requested permission from the town uh -huh. and requested a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act to put in such a facility. Mm -hmm. And until the town responds and approves or denies it, they can't move forward with the project. But sir, we've seen your letters so back and forth and you haven't, intend you haven't stated, at least from what we've seen that's been released, we haven't seen the intended use. Tonight is the first time that we've heard that. I, no. there, there's the letters. I have not tried to write a confusing letter. I, I think the letters have presented that the owner would like to use the property to use the property. He believes, and I believe, I do not represent the owner, but I do believe that they can use the property as a sober house, sober house as a matter of right. But that is not what the Process Recovery Center wants to do. The Process Recovery Center wants to put in a treatment facility. There's a question as to whether or not they could put in that facility as a matter of right. So they've asked for permission from the town and a reasonable accommodation under federal law to put in such a facility. So the town needs to respond to them as to whether or not they will allow such a use. So if you they allow such a use, let me let finish the process. Just one second. Excuse me both for a moment. Please kindly do not interrupt each other. I have, have a clarifying question for the staff that may be able to help in this question here. Um, is the occupancy permit, and I'm, I will address this either to Julie or to Chris, um, is the occupancy permit uh, required to know, um, in order to process the occupancy permit, do, does the town need to know what, the, what type of facility is going to be in this property? So the difference between a sober home and this recovery center that is being proposed, does the town need to know that in order to issue a specific type of occupancy permit? And Amy, you can use Amy's. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Chrissy, uh, Town Council. Um, there are, as I understand it, there, based on the communications between our office and the um, uh, attorney time, the, the Process Recovery Center has asked for, to put, I, well, there, there's requests to put in either a sober home or a licensed treatment facility at the property. And there is also currently pending a separate related but separate application for a certificate of occupancy for the property. The application for a CO is for a sober home. Um, the, but so, and the, the town is currently uh, has for it the application for the certificate of occupancy and uh, a request for a reasonable accommodation to allow either a sober home or a licensed treatment facility. But to answer your question, yes, I think any application for a certificate of occupancy would need to specify what use was being requested to go and place in the property. So at this point, is it clear to say that the town is uncertain whether what the use of the facility will be and therefore cannot issue this cert uh, certificate of occupancy? Do, is the town seeking more information? The town is certainly seeking more information. There is, uh, but I'm not sure that the request the application for a certificate of occupancy was filed by the property owner um, and is seeking to establish a use, the use of the property as a sober home. Uh, the town will need to respond to that application. In, I think in, as of right now, the town will need to respond to that application independent of whether a licensed treatment facility may ultimately go to the, in the property you know, six months from now or a year from now. Um, and will, the town will need to decide that application act on that application for a certificate of occupancy um, of regardless whether unless the applicant were to withdraw it. Thank you, Chris. Um, so as a point of clarification, um, is there a particular reason why the certificate of occupancy has not stated that it will, instead of being used for a sober home, that it will be used for a recovery center? So a, a, a recovery center to, to use the property as a recovery center, to use the property as a recovery center, it is likely that a reasonable accommodation needs to be sought by Process Recovery Center. 
So they have sought a reasonable accommodation, which is basically a working process with the town that says, we would like to put in this type of facility. We do not think it'll impact the town because it had X, Y, and Z. It's very similar to the prior use. And the town needs to respond as to whether or not that's something that's acceptable and respond to the reasonable accommodation. If the town approves that, then they can work on a um, certificate of occupancy. Um, but Process Recovery Center, they could ask for a certificate of occupancy, but the reasonable accommodation needs to be granted for them to receive such. So that's that process for Process Recovery Center. Separately, the owner would like to use the property in some fashion because he has an empty building. So as a matter of right, I believe he can put in a congregate living facility for the disabled under 40A section three, paragraph four, and he has submitted a certificate of occupancy for that use. Does it mean that will be the ultimate use? He's gotta figure out what type of group wants to come in there and what they want to put in. But he's just looking well, for some sort of use for an empty building. If that makes sense. It actually doesn't building. to me, and, and I'll tell you why. Because no, no, I'll explain it again. <coughs> um, you can go ahead and explain it again. My, my you feeling is just... Other people talk or just people? All right, all right, listen, um, everyone, I'd like to... Explain why I'm not, I was hold doing the talking. I'm going to... I'll yeah. give you the mic back in a second. All right. I understand that there's a lot of emotion behind this facility, and when the lawyers start going back and forth, it tends to get a little confusing. I know I got lost a little bit there when they were going back and forth. Um, so I'd like just to ask everyone to take a moment, take a step back. We are all here because we want to understand what's happening. Um, so with that in mind, um, Amy, I'm going to hand the mic back to you. Yeah. I'm going to ask if you can ask your question, hand me the mic back, and then we're going to open it up a little bit to the rest of the floor. I just want to address this gentleman. Last night, 50 of us met here, and we went over talking points and questions that we all wanted to talk about, and I was elected as a spokesperson for the neighborhood. Okay, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to hop Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess what, what the crux of the issue is here is you do have a lot of upset people because we feel like this is real muddy and we don't really know what's happening. And I feel like you guys are getting a lot of like pushback and I feel your defensiveness too because you're trying to do a good thing and you're like, can we just go into business here? I get that too. Our problem is that what you just told me basically said it will either go to them or it'll be a sober living, a sober living home. No. You said, you said that, you said you want to keep your options open. Well, of course, the, the owner has an empty building. No, but can you just answer that one question? Which one? You want to keep your options open to hold, to have it be a sober living facility or a nursing care facility. I'm assuming, this is a big assumption, that the he owner... Can, he can speak. Yes, I'm, he can speak. I'm assuming he would like to fill the building with an appropriate use. And there's only certain appropriate uses for that building. A family can't move in there. Then why you know? is getting signed? All right, we're going to pause this the, portion the right here. To, we're going to open it up that. to some of the other residents if you have any questions. Uh, you there in the back? Please, uh, here. Uh, the woman in the scarf. Let's walk Hi, everyone. My name is Jana Flynn. I live on Daring Street. I'm a single woman living by myself. Uh, I'm also a registered nurse who, unfortunately, on a daily basis deals with people who are in different phases of alcohol and drug use, as well as those with dual diagnosis, which means that they also have a psychiatric disorder associated with that. So I want to be a good person. I really do. And I want to welcome you with open arms to our neighborhood. But I have fears, just like this other woman was stating, of what will happen. So this is the very first I've heard of this. No one has communicated with me in any way regarding any of this. I don't know a single thing about this until I walked in the door tonight. All I know is that I got a letter the other day from the library. So the questions that I have for you are regarding how you would run your process recovery center. You say that there's gonna be four staff members, 24 hours a day. Could you please tell me who those four staff members would be and how they're licensed? Hi, my name is Nicole. I'm also a registered nurse. Um, so BSAS is actually, uh, if you guys 
want to make a note of that they are the people that would license us they set our standards so the staffing ratios are in alliance with what they put out so if there's he, he referenced four which can kind of be skewed let's say we had two residents and at minimum we have to have four one will always be a nurse the other will be a uh, support staff gender specific meaning that let's say we have you know two female clients two male clients they will be separated and there will be a support staff at each place so would that be an RN or an LPN an RN um, did that answer your question? And you can be SAS. Um, what does that stand for? It's Bureau of Substance, and they just changed it, so I don't want to, yeah. So, Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. So, the great thing about the state of Massachusetts is it's highly regulated. Um, is much SAS is part of the Commonwealth? Yes, it's a state, it's a state agency. Um, <coughs> and they're more than open to answer questions um you know we had the inspector out um you know just because we wanted to even see if it would even be a doable thing um you know this opportunity came to us uh, we do a lot of good work and you know <clears throat> we had the inspector come out and and they're more than open to answer all questions so if you had 24 residents mm -hmm. what would your staffing be on the night shift who would those four people be and how would they be so it'd be more than four if we had 24. Okay. um I would what would their credentials be so again the same that you would have your nursing staff you would have how many nurses for so the ratio patients? is i want to say the ratio is for one nurse for every eight people is so the, you would have three registered nurses on the night shift is the standard okay. um and then you have but Again, I can, what I could do is also send over the regulations to the city so that you guys can see that because okay. those are different things that I've already had to take a look at. But we haven't been, to be honest with you, this has been so held up with this stuff that some of the details have you know, been by the wayside, if that makes sense. So when the gentleman on the end says, says that there'll be physicians there, those physicians will basically be Monday through Friday so there'll be a medical there'll be a medical director um they'll probably most likely be a staffed psychiatric nurse practitioner um, only during the day though correct on the evenings nights weekends not nights. always not always it's not always going to be during the day um the way this but you can't guarantee that there'll be anyone other than i can guarantee registered you. nurses and unlicensed assisted personnel on hold on i lost your question i'm sorry go ahead so my concern yep is that this gentleman who's presenting this says that there'll always be doctors, nurses, always there. But I work in a hospital and yeah, I know that course. that's not the case. Of course. So basically, those social workers, all of those people, physicians, nurse practitioners, are there Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. And the rest of the time, evenings, nights, weekends, holidays, those people are not there. So it's really up to those three nurses and an unlicensed assistant personnel to run a house of 24 people. Am I, am I wrong or am I No, wrong? you are wrong. Okay. Um, All right, thank so, you. Thank you for your question. We're going to pause okay. this one That's here. Fine. Thank you. Um, Julie, if you don't mind grabbing the mic. Any questions? Uh, this, uh, the woman right here, the raised hand. Yes, you. Yep, in the gray. Excuse me. Why can't she answer that? I can. I can. I can answer. I uh, feel free. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. So what your question was that would the staff, the staffing isn't going to be staffed as Monday through Friday. It's a medical facility. That's not how staffing works. Um, staffing is accordance to the regulations that are imposed on us. So typically what that means is that if we have somebody, let's say we have somebody admin at X hour, they have to be seen by a medical doctor up front um, so staffing isn't necessarily oh it's Monday we're not going to be fully staffed you know on Saturday and Sunday or whatever that looks like um, it sounded like you were trying to indi indicate that we wouldn't have staff on Saturday and Sunday and overnights so those regulations that are saying that there's going to always be I, I, I apologize. I wasn't trying to imply that. To be to be honest, I understand what you're talking about, and 
can I guarantee there'll be a doctor on site 24 seven? No, that would be a lie. And I, and I agree with you and I'm not, tr I didn't mean to imply that. So I apologize that I did say that. There will be times where there will be a nurse and support staff. We will have, and to be honest, I, I emphasize with who you deal with because you deal with people coming in after overdoses who a lot of times don't want treatment. And I've seen my own brother in an emergency room treat people terrible. So I completely understand your concern. It, when someone, and so my response to that, my honest response to that would be by the time they get to residential, they're eight days away from that and they've chosen to go to the residential. They're in a different state than when they've come out of an overdose and they're belligerent and they're terrible or they don't want help. Cause I, and so I understand, I completely understand your concern. What I would say also is that it is our utmost concern to be friendly to the neighbors. We would not just turn somebody to the street at one o'clock in the morning. We've already talked about having, you know, bringing people to train stations if they want to be discharged. It's not like we are very concerned with the neighborhood and making sure that it is not an issue for the neighborhood. So could there be an unruly patient who wants to AMA from the facility? Yes, there could. Our plan with that would be take them to the train station. Just, just to let you know. Th these are concerns that we are thinking about. And the other Thank question you. was, do you deal with dual diagnosis patients? Are there people with psychiatric issues who have that facility? So to answer that, to answer that question for you, typically somebody uh, with an addiction disorder, primarily we're dealing with people who have anxiety or depression, anything really beyond that we're not set up to manage, um, if that answers your question. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, listen, I know folks have a lot of questions and you may have follow-up questions, but in order to be fair to all of your neighbors, please ask your one question, stop there, please allow them to answer and then we'll move on to the next person. Once everyone has had an opportunity to speak, um, people who have already spoken can try again. Um. Um, hello, my name is Laura Monahan. I live on Bancroft Ave, which is adjacent to where the Daniels house is. Um, I have a concern with um, the owner, and I apologize. I understand you bought the building, and of course you want to occupy it and you want to make money. What I heard through Amy addressing questions and you giving some answers and then the lawyer stepping in, that's a concern for me. I feel right now that we're not, you're not saying what you want. And what I'm hearing is you want to occupy it with what's going to make you the most dollars. On the table is this recovery center, which will have 24 beds. Or a sober house, which I think, what I'm hearing or what I'm believing is that you would prefer the sober house because it's not regulated. So you have a, tw we'll say a 25 room house. If you put four beds in, you can have 100 clients, or you could have six to a room, more than 100 clients. You can charge whatever you want. So the, the rent could be whatever you want. No regulation, so we don't know, are these people up with immunizations? Um, we don't know, again, with, with different um, diagnoses and illnesses, what these people are coming in with, with the sober houses. There's so many things there. And I'm really concerned that Amy, she came here to be a representative of this neighborhood of 50 people, and she was asking questions. So she was basically asking one question per 50 people. She should have had an opportunity, and I understand it doesn't seem fair. One person seems to be generating a lot of the time, and we only have till nine o'clock, but we do, we have till nine o'clock. So I really want to hear from you, sir. Is this true that you really are considering this recovery center? Or are you looking for the biggest bang for your dollar? Please be honest with us, because this is our neighborhood with our library, a walking distance to schools, to churches, to, to our downtown of active living, and we care very much about it. We care about the ill as well. I'm a registered nurse. I work in a day hub. We, we all have alcoholism and, and, and drug use in our family somewhere, I'm sure. So we, we support and, and we, but can you answer that for us? What is the intention, please? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, there are a couple things I would like to clear up. Um, so hi, I'm Dan. I bought the building in the fall. I 
Uh, within a few days of buying the building, um, was contacted by the assistant town manager, um, and have wanted to had, uh, have you know clear and transparent communication with them since then. We set up a meeting um, to, to talk about what we could do with the building. So my understanding is by right, there are a number of things we can do. We can do um, essentially congregate living for the disabled by right. So I have not applied, um, as, as the, the town council said, just to clarify, I have not applied for a sober house. I have applied for uh, specifically the languages congregate living for the disabled, which would apply to a veterans home. Uh, and as part of the uh, veterans organization that um, I've actually had three meetings with them, and I think they'd be a good candidate. I met with a variety of sober home operators. Uh, and I met with the Process Recovery Center, um, and, and as Justin said, they do operate uh, some sober homes. That's not their intended use for this property, and that's not what I intend for this property either. My intention for this property is to sign a lease with them. We've already worked out the terms. Um, it's just a matter of we can't sign a lease if we don't know what the process is going to be like with the town. And although their attorney tells me that uh, we can likely get a um, this this licensed treatment center approved we'd need your support so Amy you asked earlier what is stopping me from signing a lease with these guys the only thing is that we don't know if the town will cooperate or if they won't if the town will cooperate no I don't intend to put in a sober house that's unrestricted I'd like to sign a lease with them and let them do what they want so hopefully the rest of this session is about you guys understanding what they do and asking questions about them I I'm a businessman yes I'm here to make money that's why I bought the building, but I would like to do it in a way that is responsible and reasonable. That's why I've had clear communications with the town. Uh, from all the people that I met with, I like the Process Recovery Center <laughs> the best. I thought they, you know, they run a reasonable organization. They've been doing this for several years. They have experience with us. Um, it's a nice building. It's it's in a nice part of town. Um, you know, Reading is a nice community, and I don't want to have my name in the paper for being a, a property owner that isn't responsible and um, is just trying to make the most money, um, I would like to do something that is actually going to help hopefully serve the community. One of the ideas that um, the Process Recovery Center had was helping to perhaps prioritize uh, residents in writing for this particular facility. Um, so again, this, this meeting shouldn't really be about me, but just to clarify what it is that I want to do, I would like to sign a lease with them. We've already agreed on all the terms. The only thing we haven't agreed on is when they're going to move in and open up shop and the process suggested to us was let's open up conversations with the town so everyone can ask questions about what's going to happen, what it would look like, um, and, and the town has hesitated in, in sort of responding uh, how they feel about things until they know what we're going to do, how we're proposing to do it. So I, I'm happy to answer more questions, but I really think for the most part, hopefully you guys like what they can do, and, and yes, I could put in a sober house, I could put in a, a veterans organization, there are a variety of protected classes that the building would, would clearly be well suited to serve, and I'd like to rent to one of those as a business person, as somebody who's also just trying to do something reasonable, I'd like to rent to an organization that I think is gonna be you know, a good member of the community and responsible and, and hopefully fill a need. Um, and, and I like these guys for that. So again, happy to answer more questions, but I think for the most part, the rest of this meeting, hopefully, is about you guys understanding you know, what, what they're gonna do and what they're gonna bring to the community. What's the matter of curiosity? <coughs> uh, I, I've been working with a, a veterans organization uh, that's based in uh, in Haverhill, um, and I've, I've had several other meetings. But um, you know, at, at this point, I I can't tell them all like, oh yeah, just hang out for six to twelve months while writing figures. That, you know, these are organizations that they need to move quickly if there's an opportunity. Um, so at, at this point, this is the the only group that I want to work with. Uh, but for them to do what they want to do, they need to know that they have your support. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this gentleman here in the front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yusuf Dafai, I live on uh, 76, just died of the library. And uh, I just, uh, my question basically is for the, uh, for the town. I just not, I just want to know, I mean, first of all, let, let me just say uh, that I have nothing against uh, people who have it, this issue. My son died. Can you can you use the microphone? Hold the mic. Hold the mic. Hold the mic. Yeah. Uh, my my son died of an overdose, so I know very well these these uh, these issues. So to suggest to put people people who are, who have drugs and alcohol issues, people uh, they have issues. To suggest to put a center 
in the middle of a residential, a residential area, in my opinion, is is not responsible. And I, I want to know what the what the town is saying about this. So I, I just want I don't I don't know what my right is as a, as, a, as a resident, whether I will have a say in this one or whether the town is going to speak for me when I when I voice my opinion. So I want to know from the town what what the the actions are to for this process to, to, to be completed. That. <laughs> I want to know what the position of the town in terms of approving the, the either a treatment center or whatever whatever business that's going to be put in. What what is the position of the town with it? And I think the answer is that as of right now, the town doesn't have an official position on either of the two the two uses that are under discussion, either a um, congregate living facility for disabled people or the licensed treatment facility. The town has received a request effectively to say that both can go into this property, and the town is currently in the process of evaluating that request from the applicant. Neither, neither use is specifically allowed under the town zoning bylaw, but the applicant has made the argument that both uses uh, must be allowed to go in under federal and state law. Uh, not the town of Reading's laws, but federal and state. So though, because it's these are two uses that are not allowed under the, part of the town zoning bylaw, but the argument has been presented that they are allowed under federal and state law, the town is currently evaluating those arguments and has not yet come to a conclusion on either one. <coughs> Nancy? Uh, Nancy Doctor, Pearl Street. Please. Oh, microphone, please. Thank you. Nancy Doctor, Pearl Street, and I wanted to welcome you to Reading. My um, mother-in-law spent the last few uh, weeks of her life, actually, at the Daniels House receiving very compassionate care. Um, and I'm delighted that this would be repurposed for a recovery unit. Um, it would be wonderful. Instead of someone having the end of their life care, it would be start anew. So I actually think it's a wonderful use of the property. I had a couple of questions. <coughs> Reading recently became, I think it's called dementia friendly, and I'm wondering how you would work to make Reading recovery friendly in terms of, would you be willing to work with RACASA on a regular basis and what that would possibly look like in order to make the town more adaptive? Would you work on grants perhaps to have more um, entertainment that's not alcohol based in our downtown area. Um, I'd be interested in what you've done in other facilities, in communities that way. Um, the other question I guess I would have is, would you be willing to do more community sessions like this? Would you be willing to do more involvement in the community around addiction, substance use uh, disorders, and kind of what has that looked like in your New Hampshire facility? <coughs> Um, well, you know, I, I just want to say that I'm not, um, I'm from North Reading, so I'm, I'm almost a neighbor. And um, I got into this field because of my daughter who became addicted to heroin. Her, and I was living in Marblehead at the time, so I was... Can you tell us what your, like, what your role is with this group? I'm on the board. Yeah, I'm on the board. And I'd like to see this happen because um, this is, um, my daughter was fortunate enough to go to the process recovery in New Hampshire and she has two and a half years uh, sobriety right now. So I know, I know how uh, a good, well-run, um, regulated uh, treatment center can help. And I, so I, I, you know, I feel very strongly about that. I currently um, <clears throat> I'm a family recovery coach. I have practice in North Reading, and I do work with the, with I, with um, families, with the community. I set up family meetings for people that are interested, kind of like a learn to cope type meetings in other areas across the um, across the state and across the country. And I have a book I think that's in the library here. Um, but I, I would be very very happy to do that um, on behalf of the of the process. Work with the town. Work with the um, work with families that are struggling and. Um, and provide access and I think 
that that's a that's just a beautiful idea and I would be more than happy to do that myself and I know that you would all be on board I mean it's probably we would like to be a resource in the community because there's so many um, so many people that are affected by this and as you know I'm sure you, most people don't know what to do until you're in the middle of it, you know, because nobody ever expects this to happen. Certainly I didn't. And um, so I think the fact that the idea of it being a resource in the community would be an excellent idea. And I just wanted to say that, yeah, there did feel tension, but what a lovely <laughs> group of people who have been really welcoming and thank you so much for that kindness. That was really appreciated. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna Amy, I'd like to turn it back over to you. I, I stole your thunder a little bit earlier, so I'm just going to give you back the mic. <coughs> um, I, I just want to address what um, some of the tension is, and thank you. We are all the people here. Nobody wants to see people afflicted with any sort of disease. We understand that most of us in this room, my own family included, have had these issues and have had to lean on different organizations for support. What the real fear is here is that we, um, we know that this population that is in a very desperate and a very delicate part of their lives are not able to put their own well interests above their addiction. What we're hearing now is that there's two options on the table. You'd like to move forward with a um, residential, um, what was the exact term? A, a drug and a residential drug and alcohol treatment center. So, um, and and if that doesn't work, and or I thought I heard somewhere around there. For us, just to be clear, we own a separate organization called Rise Above that we do sober living with, mm -hmm. and Rise Above is not here to open sober living at the Daniels House, and will not be asking to do that. Yeah. So I'm here in capacity of the process. We do have a completely separate organization that does sober living, and. Our organization has no intention of doing that. So I just want to compartmentalize two issues then. So your facility, um, <clears throat> it sounds like the lesser of two evils, to, to be honest. Yeah, and I don't want to call it an evil. That's a bad way to say it. And I apologize. That was a misstep. But um, that is one use for it. There are some unknowns and people are nervous. And I think that you can understand that because it's such a deeply residential area. Um, the other part of it is that there is, what I keep hearing is maybe on the table, and I understand this is separate from you, maybe on the table a sober living facility. And the fear of these residents is that a sober living facility has zero, zero regulation. I don't believe it helps. Um, sometimes there's really great operators, sometimes there aren't great operators. In our neighboring town, a dead body was found in the backyard and nobody knew how we got there. And he was a patient of that home. That family is suffering. We don't know what happened there. The, the Wakefield Police Department went in and said, you have 50 people living in this home. You need to put in sprinklers. And their attorney wrote back, we can do whatever we want. We're a protected class. So the knee-jerk reaction and the fear that you're hearing from this group is that from a sober living facility, we don't think that that is the best interest of the community or the residents because it's pretty insane to have a 25 or 50 or 75 or 100 person sober home with no regulations. So that scares the daylights out of us. Again, I don't think it's good for them and I don't think it's good for us. When we talk about the fact that um, you feel that under both um, options, the town has to do this, I just wanna make sure everyone in the room understands. One way to go is through a nursing facility and you're looking for the town to give a nursing facility permit. If you don't, you will claim that it is discrimination and sue us for it. If there is a, um, if there's a sober living facility, you feel that you are, have a right to do that. In our bylaws, it says that more than four people cannot live in a single family home who are not related. If we try to enforce our bylaws, you will sue us for discrimination. So, um, Attorney Tyne, I don't mean to be accusatory here, but we, we are aware of your record and your business model of suing towns. So I think when people got here, they, there is this like knee-jerk reaction, maybe, maybe, or a well-researched reaction, 
that we have a lot of anxiety about the fact that this is a, um, a very children family area this library is a very children family area and there's concerns about the comings and goings of that house I know I personally know a lot of people who have overdosed in um, residential treatment facilities and sometimes that's not in the house we're a little worried that that could be in our library bathrooms again this is not a not in my backyard situation this is the only person that I see profiting from this and, and when I say profiting I mean like um, having a good life from this if it is a sober living facility is you sir because you will be collecting the rent I get it we're all in business all of us have to earn a living I think secondarily as we talk about this function that you'd like to bring here um, on the surface yeah, it sounds a lot better than a sober living facility, not just for the residents of the town, but probably the residents of that building. But I think that there um, has been a lot of murkiness and a lot of um, not fully saying what the intended use was. And I understand maybe there's some legalese there, but to um, the layman and to our attorneys, it seems like there is a little bit of tap dancing to set up for the secondary lawsuit. So that's why you come here today and people are very on edge and people are very concerned because we feel like our town's hands are tied. Um, I think the only thing worse than having a sober living facility across the street, that an unregulated for-profit sober living facility across the street from our town library is for you to sue us and have our special education fund instead go to you. Um, so out of the two, yes, we, we understand what you want to do is a much more um, family friendly neighborhood friendly situation but I think we want to learn a lot more about the security about um, who's coming and going again nobody here is saying addicts are bad people addicts are horrible people addicts are out to, to get everyone and steal things and harass our children none of us are saying that because we all the, the state of the world is have addicts in our lives but what we are saying is that this is a population of people in a very difficult, delicate spot in their lives who cannot put their own well interests ahead of their disease. So I cannot expect them to put the well interest of my family and my fellow residents ahead of their disease. So I would love, first of all, I just wanted to state that about the sober living facility and you know, you know you have us between a rock and a hard place because you're gonna get paid either way if you sue us or if you force the issue. And also to say, um, so I guess that's just a mute point that's bad for us no matter what. But then also to state that um, I think talking a little bit more about the comings and goings of who would be there, how they're coming in, how they're leaving. Is there any, um, is there any free coming and going? Is there any security, added security that you would have there? Um, what is the what's stopping you from having 50 patients there versus 24 patients um, there's you know a little concern about congestion as well if you're if suddenly you're gonna have 50 patients what um, rules do you have to abide by and and you know you seem like a nice guy I'm not here to like fight you um, but I am here you know for this for this neighborhood and for this town and we want to understand how we can responsibly move forward because right now there's some threatening behavior and we all know that that you're going to sue us and we want to understand what the situation is with you and what that is going to look like for our life if you do get it and also i'd love to know what how long is your lease your proposed lease that hasn't been signed thank you amy uh, so Justin if you would like to answer the security question first and then um, Dan if you'd like to address the other issues sure okay. so security wise people are medically admitted so they we normally would transport them to the facility nobody will be coming to the facility and parking cars only staff will have cars because obviously no no ambulances um, so detox normally treats people with medical conditions so once they're medically cleared then which is normally between five and seven days then they're discharged from detox and they're allowed to go to a step down which is residential now residential they still get medical care so they would be medically admitted they would be medically discharged so the, the there's no coming and going if someone walked out of the building they would 
essentially the AMA, against medical advice. That's what AMA means. Um, so there is no coming and going. Patients aren't allowed to leave and come back. It's, it's not allowed. They'd be what discharged. Stops what stops them from leaving? So nothing stops them to be, nothing stops them to be honest. We can't have locked doors. It's actually against regulations. Um, so they have to be allowed to leave. We have thought about this, just to be clear, and we would try to put in precautions where we transport anybody that's just leaving, we transport them to the train station. That, that, that is our goal. If someone just walked out the door, could we do anything about that? No. Would we notify the police? Yes. Just to be clear, we would do that. We are not trying to operate. You know, the the concern of the neighbors is a concern of ours also, and, and your safety, and you know, I understand the concern, to be honest, I do. And so we would do, we would put everything in place to address those concerns. So it's not, there is no coming and going, it's not allowed. They're, they're medically admitted, and normally when they're medically discharged, they're transported either home or to another facility. Again, Thank you. Uh, can you can you please hold no, for just a moment, no sir? There's no visits. That's another thing. There's no visiting while while you're in residential treatment. So it's just patients there getting treatment for two to three weeks normally, two to four weeks, I would say. Yes. Thank you, Justin. Can we can we? Well, I asked a question about how many people on it. There's anything stopping you from having additional people? There. So that's regulated by BDAS. It's obviously you know depends on. So we have a bunch of. Our proposed use with it, we need a bunch of offices and other stuff, so not every room in that building is going to be for residential. So the 24 for us is to responsibly operate the facility, and that's what we went to the state of Massachusetts for. So that's our intention. What could stop us from, I mean, we could apply to add a few more if we wanted to, but we'd be removing offices, so that's not, that's not our intention. We'd have to go to the state and apply for more licensed beds. Right. Thank you for that. Please, I, yep, I'm going to, Dan, if you don't mind answering the, the original question. Uh, you asked about a lease. I think we're <coughs> contemplating a five-year lease. What was the other question about suing you? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it just seems that the, the track record of Mr. Tyne here is, is to sue towns who try to stop it. You believe that you can be here under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we understand that, but we also have something in our bylaws that say that we can only have four people living in a home <clears throat> pardon me, who are not related um, in order for it to be a single family usage. And if it's a sober home, then it is a single family usage and it's a single family zoned neighborhood. So I'm curious, when you say you believe that you have the right, is that your course of action? That the, the right would be if we tried to uphold our zoning laws that you would sue the town? <coughs> I, I don't make decisions for clients as to what they want to do. Okay, I, I actually don't even. Like I, I actually. I actually don't even represent the, the business owner. I represent Process Recovery because okay. they want to put in a treatment facility. Actually, everyone here wants to put in a treatment facility. I know things keep getting redirected to a sober house, which is not what we're here to try to accomplish. What we're here to try to accomplish is to try to present to everyone here to ask questions about the proposed treatment facility. The the owner could use the property for other purposes. As he said, veterans' home, sober home, and I assume there's other things that can be used for a nursing home again. The fear so, of the business model. We will come here if we cannot. We will sue you, and we'll get our money either way. That's okay, so no, no one has said that, so I don't understand where that comes from. Uh, but the, the, Amy, I'm going to ask you to just. Yeah, hold. I mean, the, the reality is that you know you keep saying, you keep directing this personally at me. I mean, I am a lawyer, so I am a litigation attorney, so I do handle lawsuits. I do sue people. I file a lawsuit every other day. That's what I do. A doctor goes to the hospital and they operate and see people. That's what we do for work. So, I mean, I'm sorry if that offends you, but that is what I uh, do Mr. for Tyne, work. Mr. Tyne, could I ask you to pause there for just a moment? Um, it, the Hi. question at this point stands of the intention behind the use. Dan, I understand We've said it several times. It's, it's the same thing. Process Recovery Center would like to move in and open a treatment facility. All right. Um, given this line of question, I think perhaps it might be helpful, um, Dan, if uh, offline a conversation could take place between the staff, perhaps town attorney, your own attorney, um, as far as the permitting process itself. Sure. And so currently I'm not represented by an attorney. Attorney Tyne is here representing the Process Recovery Center. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk to the town. I guess, so Amy, to answer your question specifically, no, I'm not looking to sue the town. Um, I'm not afraid of getting into a lawsuit if that's what I need to do to protect my rights as a property owner uh, in the town of Reading. Um, 
uh, but it's certainly not what I'm intending to do. What I'd like to do is, I think I've found the best user for the building. Um, I wanted them to come here and, and talk to you guys about what's going on. But yeah, the, the town of Reading has some bylaws that are at odds with what is uh, federal and state law. And I think that's open to interpretation. And that's open to interpretation. And, and so certainly there is the possibility that if the town doesn't let me do what I think is allowed by law, again, not town law, but, but state and federal law, that yes, we could file a lawsuit to you know, find a way to have the building be used in a way that makes sense for the building. It, it was recently a nursing home. Um, obviously, it's it's well suited to, um, to to serve a number of residents. Uh, it's got sprinklers. It's um, ADA compliant. Uh, it makes sense to use it the way it, it is. So I, I'm rather than trying to tear it down and build luxury condos or any other use, what seems to make sense to me is use it in the way that it's already set up. Um, why rip down a perfectly good building? It's environmentally responsible to repurpose it for something that we need. This is something that we need. This is something that it's suited for. Um, and these are folks that can operate it far better than I. And, and as you said, better than a sober house. So I'm not looking to put in a sober house, just to be very clear. But yes, I, I'm entitled to use it under federal and state law as uh, a place of congregate living for disabled folks. I would like to find a way to do that with an organization that will do it. Um, where, where there's you know no concern when I go to sleep at night that I've you know created this this awful thing that everyone's going to be upset about. So that that hopefully that answers your question about what my intentions are. Thank you, Dan. Uh, gentleman here on the blue shirt. Hi, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I guess my primary concern is the location. To me, this is. Well, I grew, up, I grew up in this neighborhood, I live around the corner. This is a neighborhood highly trafficked by kids. And there's kids walking to the library all times of the day. And so for me, it just doesn't seem the responsible choice to place a, an organization like this near a library. But I would like to hear a little bit about any information you have about statistics around the term you use was ADA in, or uh, relapsing in the facility you currently run. So in the facility, I mean, if in the facility we currently run, do we have AMAs? Yes, we do. Yeah, AMA, against medical advice. So we do have AMAs. They do happen in every treatment center. Um, one treatment center I would probably reference, just that, you know, RCA in Danvers, it's the Hunt Hospital. It was the Hunt Hospital in Goodwill Hunting. They renovated it. It's now 150, 175 bed drug and alcohol treatment center. Um, same, you know, same concerns. It, it's actually in a nice neighborhood, the Hunt Hospital. They put $25 million back into the Hunt Hospital to renovate it. So they're detox and residential. That's what they do there. They do detox and residential. I think they've had no problems. And, and so I, I understand the concern with the children and uh, it, the, the only response to that would be our, our intention is not to just let somebody AMA and just be interrupting kids like we would literally notify the police that's our that, that would be our goal if someone was unruly and just stormed out of the building our our protocol would be notify the police immediately so the police can come to tank to talk to the person and potentially you know help them get where they need to go so because they're obviously don't live in the neighborhood so they need to go somewhere so we have zero intention of someone just leaving the facility and hanging out outside. That's, it wouldn't happen. It's not going to happen. Um, so currently, I would say it's, it's the same. When people AMA, we normally notify them. We get their belongings. We notify their family. We arrange rides for them to leave, and they leave. It's been very rare. It's, it's a rarer case that someone walks out and just starts walking down the street. Thank you, Justin. Uh, gentleman here in the cap. I did. What I like? Why did I lie to you about? Could you tell us about the 2017 uh, report to the Department of Public Health that ceased admissions to the Danvers RCA because of patient safety concerns and a death on that property? Well, 
I, I don't run RCA. It was actually a staffing issue, I think, that mainly shut down that facility because based. Okay. Well, I was. Yeah, you just said there would have no problem. All right, hold on, everybody, please. In the neighborhood, Justin. Uh, all right, gentleman here in the baseball cap. My name is uh, my name is Tim Martin. I uh, live down the street with my wife and uh, two kids. My main, first, I want to thank you for coming in and presenting today. Thank you. My main question is to the town, actually, and its and its government members that are here. My question is with the topic of certificates of occupancy, use groups, and changes of use groups. Why isn't there a member of the building commission here to help us facilitate these questions? Chris, do you want to take this one? Um, okay, I'll answer that. So um, our building commissioner did offer to be here tonight, um, but we, because of the uncertainty of what's proposed, you know, we were, were hesitant to have to have lots of staff here who might misspeak and mislead um, until we know more about what's proposed. It's the honest answer. Thank you. More questions? Uh, gentleman in the gray shirt or white shirt? Yep, you. Standing. Um, oh, uh, Julie, do you no, mind getting him the mic? It's all right. So, if, if you were given a, a license occupancy permit for uh, active recoveries um, for your business, in five years comes up, the lease is up. Um, I guess the question is to town council: um, Would 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 you require um, a new occupancy permit for, let's say, uh, a, a, a drug and alcohol uh, re re recovery um, facility? In other words, a change of use after five years. Would they need to come back to you? And if they got the occupancy, the go ahead to go and um, run the um, recovery system for, for and at least it's up in five years, what's to preclude him from opening um, an alcohol recovery? Thank you. In other words, from a licensed facility to an unlicensed facility. Yeah, well, the, again, the town hasn't uh, officially said that either one is allowed at the property. Understood. But, but if we get one step further... But the applicant has proposed... To answer your question, the applicant has proposed both in the alternative, and if they, establish, if they were to successfully establish one use at the property, nothing would prevent them from... Let's a, say we a give them... No. We go ahead. She's right. Laura's right. Let's say we go ahead and they can do give it. them a permit. Be okay to go ahead and do it. In five years, when the lease is up, what's to prevent him from just turning it into an unlicensed facility and doing what he wants? Can I answer the question for you? We, can, we, can we please allow the attorney to answer? So we would need to evaluate that proposal at the time. No, but nothing would prevent them from attempting to establish the use. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can I answer the question? Time. So sure. So the answer to the question is they've asked for a reasonable accommodation under federal law. That's an agreement between the town and the operator. So the town would actually craft an agreement that's acceptable to them. The parties would sign off on it. As part of that agreement, they could put any limitations the town desires with respect to the use of the property as long as the parties agree. So the town could say it could be used by this specific operator for this specific yeah, purpose. I understand. And, and that's why I wanted to respond, is that you can limit it in that way to protect you in the fashion that you'd like to be protected. It just needs to be crafted between the parties as part of a back and forth process. Thank you. More questions? And actually, if I can just follow up on that, and I'd, I'd be happy to be limited in such a way if we end up having the support of the town to move forward with this particular group and the particular use that they're asking for, um, I'd be willing to have some sort of restriction put on the building that if they stop using it in that manner, that I would need to, again, go through a new process to have any other use in the building, just to be clear about my intentions. But to Amy's point, it doesn't preclude you from suing the town to get. Uh, it, it does not preclude me from suing the town, right? I mean, that we, we believe that's something we can do by right uh, under the federal and state protections. Thank you. Can we have the microphone over here, please? Hi, uh, my name's John. I live right down the street. Uh, we have all been affected by addiction. I think we can all 
Roll our eyes, we can nod our heads. We all have the right to do what we want as a person and a citizen of this town. We also have a right to question when people come into our town what their intent is. That's what we're here to do. I do commend the work you do. As for myself, I've been touched very personally by addiction. But one thing that comes up in my mind consistently is the logistics of how the building's gonna be handled as far as, are you saying that the people that enter this building are in lockdown, that they can't congregate outside the building to maybe smoke cigarettes and wave that air pollution into our neighborhood? where well, I have two very young children. And when that was the Daniels home, the people that worked there were not allowed to go into the parking lot, walk down our streets smoking cigarettes, littering all over our streets. They would attempt to. They would attempt to on a monthly basis that I would have to then call the management and say, can you tell your employees to get back into the building? They're not allowed to do it there. They're not allowed to do it here. Noise pollution. How do you expect to handle noise pollution? Are they not allowed to go out onto the balconies and enjoy a starlit night and maybe have the radio blaring? They can't sleep. They're used to staying up all night. Maybe they can't sleep. They're out there at 2 a.m. playing the music. Is that regulated? Is that controlled? Or are they allowed to do it? How does that all get regulated? Because we as neighbors all respect each other's personal space. But that's a large building. You're telling us you're gonna be able to guarantee they're going to act as we expect our neighbors to. And one last question for you, gentlemen. Sir, if you don't mind, if you want the, the best for this facility in the way that it is constructed now, which I'm a business owner, I understand, I get it. But if there's this much pushback from a neighborhood, why would you wanna push this through? You say you want to be able to sleep at night. If I look in the room and I look around and this much tension is coming to me from something I'm doing for business, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night. And I would probably say, maybe I should look at putting another elderly home in there. Something that was successful and accepted. So it is a two-fold question, but it would be nice to get an answer from both. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Justin, would you like to answer the question regarding... Um, um, Local sure, so there would be a smoking area, to be honest. Every facility has one. Um, well, our facility would. And every facility pretty much does in general. So I, I'm not trying to dispute that. No, and, I, I and so, and I appreciate your concern about that. Again, it would be something that we would look at and try to address to be a supervised small area. Most, and, I understand I understand the concern when you talk about unruly behavior that would be something that would be handled by staff can I guarantee that there will never be unruly behavior no if someone was playing music outside at 12 o'clock at night and they would either be you know told you gotta shut that up that's that's not allowed period or and if they refuse if they're unruly they're gonna be asked to leave I mean it's you know we don't it's not it's a controlled facility at the end of the day. We don't want one person acting out causes everybody to act up. It's, it's just the way that it is. So you do have to run it in a controlled manner where you have rules and regulations. And in my experience, if you respect people and you show them respect and love, I'm just sharing for our facility, they'll show the same back. Will you have some unruly clients once in a while? Yes, you will. And so can I guarantee that there will never be an unruly client? Who will cause a commotion i can't to be honest and will it happen at some point it probably will i have to be honest like i can't will i call the police on that person absolutely Do, will it happen all the time no i in my experience no it won't um, allow smoking. yes okay. Okay. we've got children around the neighborhood thank you thank you john uh thank you justin dan if you want to Thanks. I think I was being asked uh, if I'm going to be able to sleep at night. Is that the question? I think you understood the question. You, you want me to put in a nursing home? Wouldn't you feel, if you're looking out at a room like this, me as a business owner, if there was this much tension with a business transaction I'm doing, I have a, I have more and John, I would actually let's, think John, let's keep it clean. 
So I'll answer the question. So I I bought the property. I asked my office to call all of the available nonprofits that meet the standard of who could use this building that used to be a nursing home that could again be a nursing home. Uh, who who can use it to house uh, to be congregate living for persons with disabilities? We did call nursing homes. We called a, a whole variety of folks. The reason reading a press release from their website that this particular former nursing home shut down is because they weren't making any money. There, there were wage freezes and it wasn't a profitable business for them, so they consolidated. That's probably similar uh, a similar reason to why no nursing homes that we reached out to wanted to come and take a look at the property to, to rent it. So I, I tried to talk to them. Um, having met with a dozen different potential users for the property, the one that I thought was the best fit for the community or, or the folks who are here. So yes, I can sleep at night having tried to find some somebody that I think will be a responsible user for the property and, and trying to <coughs> participate in, in a public process to um, to introduce them to you so you can ask some questions and, and get answers to those questions. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Thank you. Sure. All right. Yep. Go All ahead. Right. Uh, uh, Julie, can you get from the microphone? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. You brought up renovations. Are these renovations going to impact the traffic around the town, uh, this area, the library? And is the work going to be done by licensed professionals in the state of Massachusetts to do this work? There are no, no renovations are planned. He so said he was going to take some of the headrooms and make them offices. That's just probably painting and bringing in furniture, but unless Justin wants to. Yeah. No. No, no renovations. No renovations inside or outside the building? No. Everything's going to be carpet and paint. And I, it, there, uh, yes, but if we did renovations, everything would be done with licensed professionals. And it would all be part of the code? The building? There's, there's, so I, I had the uh, building commissioner out there uh, along with the folks from planning and fire last week. And my understanding um, is that everything is up to code. The building sprinkled, alarmed. We're replacing the fire panel in the building now um, just because there was a one, one bad sensor on it. But it is to code. Um, so it's not it's not an issue of bringing the building to code. It's really just an issue of what can we do with the building to make it um, you know to, to make it work for uh, for for the use that we're applying for. Thank you. Thank you, um, Julie. Uh, the woman here. No. And I, before you ask your question, I do want to let everyone know it is 8.30. We have about 30 minutes left before the library closes. Um, so just by a show of hands, how many more people would like to ask questions or make statements? All right. Um, given that, if I could ask everyone just to be sensitive to time when it's your turn to speak. Thank you. Hey, thank you. My name is Stacy, and I actually work in the field of addiction. So I sort of feel conflicted about having the, you know, resident, the residential program here. But my question is, do you have any data on um, how many people in a given week leave AMA? Do you have any data on, have you had any overdoses in any of your other facilities? What might the impact be in terms of our uh, public services like um, police calls, EMT calls, stuff like that, those resources that we as taxpayers pay for? So, the, the, I do have you know data Normally AMAs of, at our facility now, we have about 60 clients in New Hampshire, is between 5 and 11 a month, AMA. That, now, that those can be misleading because AMA could be, you know, they could be there for 45 days and just decide they want to go home. We still have to classify it as AMA if we thought they were going to get 60 days of treatment. But, um, so those are the numbers. What, what was your other question? I'm sorry. So the, the how many AMAs? Because then the concern is like if they're leaving AMA at in, in two in the morning, like where are you going to bring them reasonably? There's no train to bring them to. Yeah, I understand. Um, it's, it's a legitimate and question. What about like accidental overdoses in the facility? Have you had any? Overdoses? So yes, we've had one overdose in five years. Um, in our facility um, with someone who snuck drugs in. It is a concern. Yeah. It happens. It definitely happens. It's it's a concern of ours that we address all the time. We do searches um, and it's not something that we take lightly, I can assure you. Um, but we, it's one in the last five years. We've and the had. last part of that question was like, what's the impact on like our police and fire department? Like how many calls in a week or month do your other facilities have to those public services? 
we just had tax rate increases. Our okay. some properties were all reassessed, and all those rates went up. So like, we're paying a lot. Like if we sure. have to employ more police. That's more tax burden on us. Yeah, at our facility, I would say last year was probably a couple times, and they were from medical emergencies, not overdoses. Um, there was a seizure of a client, um, so it, it was about two. Do I have data on what it would cost? I don't, so to be honest. I'm sorry. It's fine. Oh, Thank one you. More. Can I ask Do you take Section 35? No. Not at all, ever, because when there's an overflow at Bridgewater, sometimes they're farmed out to other trees. So, it, just to be clear, I mean, I, I just want to talk about it. We're, we're going to be mainly a private insurance facility, and there is a difference between a private insurance facility and a Bridgewater. Um, and you know, so, like Star and the other places on the South Shore near Bridgewater they're all, take the overflow. They're all Mass Health. Yeah, they're all Mass Health. Those are all mass we'll health. Obligated to take <coughs> mass health we are obligated to take a percentage of mass health, yes, but we primarily operate as a private insurance facility. So the people that come to us primarily have private insurance. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question, gentlemen here in the Boston Church. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I don't need one. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Michael Moresco. I live on Grand Street. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think prior to this evening, I, for one, had only heard snippets of information, and the information was revolving around a sober house. Uh, and the fears that that caused were, were pretty significant because of everything that's been said. Um, and at the beginning of this, frankly, because of your comments, I really thought that you guys had put together a pretty neat political term by saying either or. Either you approve your facility or we're going to stick a sober living house in. Uh, the owner has got my fears down just a little bit and my question is I think it's a combo. I'm a retired teacher. I'm not an attorney so bear with me. I think it's a combo question between for town council and the owner. My understanding as you go if I'm correct as you go through this process towards agreement there is some sort of document that the town can offer for you to sign that will have stipulations, as you had said previously. Uh, would you be willing, if the town were to put in a stipulation that this property could never be a sober house, would you be willing to sign that? And can we do that, town council? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan, would you sure. like to give your talk? I'd be open to something like that. I guess I think it would require a deed restriction, but um, I don't. I don't have a, a objection to that. So if if we were able to allow this particular facility, yes. I guess the the issue would be, let's say in let's say it were a five year lease. After five years, let's say I also agreed to other language that said if these guys left, it, it can be you know it, again it's up for debate. If it then couldn't be. A sober house, then, and the, and then, in other words, if, if it couldn't, if it would reduce what I could do in terms of, I couldn't even do what I'm could do now. I, I'd have to look at it, in other words, with an attorney and figure out how much that's limiting my my rights. But generally, I'm fine with what you're suggesting. Uh, I'm not looking to put a sober house in that location. I, I just don't want to have my rights limited, or the property owner, if it's a new property owner in the future, I don't want to have their rights limited beyond what protections are afforded them by, by state and federal law. But that's more of a legal answer, like specifically, yes, I'm interested in trying to work out an agreement with the town that everyone's okay with, and if it limits it to just these folks um, doing specifically what it is that they've been presenting to you tonight, I'm fine with that, I'm ready to sign a lease to that effect. Hey, but my question was specifically, I have to say you have to make money, I'm not trying to not prevent you from making money. The, the wording would be solely that this property could never be used for a sober house. It could still be used for a veteran house, a nursing home, whatever you want, just by law prohibiting a sober house there. Can we do that, town council? Is that? I could probably put a deed restriction on the property that would create that permanent requirement. I probably would be willing to do that. I can't commit to it right now. I but, and I have responsibility to, so I'm the manager of an, an, an entity, it's a, an LLC. 
um, and add, add a partner. And um, but yes, I think I could probably do what you're saying because I, I I do understand the pushback and the concern from the neighborhood. Um, I think a licensed facility would be actually quite, a, you know, n not a very significant um, change. I, and I, obviously, it's hard for me to say to the, the neighbors around there, but. Uh, having seen a few of these um, organizations operate, you know, often you drive by, you don't even think anyone's there during the day. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I can see how a sober house might be different with no regulations. It's not my intention to put that in there. Um, and, yeah, if that were something that I could put in that would make the town feel better uh, and, and the neighbors feel better, um, I, I think I'd be willing to do that. I just can't commit to it today. But it's something that you guys can certainly suggest the town puts in their agreement, and I'd, I'd certainly be open to it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, right, no, uh, sir. Thank you. Did you did you want to jump in? <laughs> With the property owners' agreement, I think that's something we could we could do. All right, Ray. Uh, just wait for the microphone, if you would. I'm good. Earlier in the evening, you were talking about the technical issues that you have in accepting your private insurance. A lot of this addiction, come the things that comes with it, is mental health. And I would, I'm kind of, I just want to get clarification as to are there restrictions on certain patients that you'll take depending on the medical history and where does that screening happen? Are there any restrictions for you guys? Sure. Um, so anyone before they come into the facility, they have to be pre-screened. So wherever they're coming from, they have to do a phone screen prior to coming in. And so we already have like, our facility up in New Hampshire where JACO certified. So JACO, that's another layer of regulations. So it depending on what JACO requires from us and also what the state requires from us, our pre-assessments will be based on their reg regulations. And your physician does a medical, does a so what they, check on these guys? Say these that people? again, I'm sorry. So who's, who's doing the medical history check on them as far as what their no. So prior to somebody coming in, typically the clinical director would have to look at their pre-assessment and then they fi they finalize that. They, they'll they'll say the yes or the no. And, or sometimes during a pre-assessment, there are certain things that would stop the assessment and, and warrant a referral to somewhere else. Or they'd get the case manager back on the phone from where they are and we would say that you know, we're not, we're not equipped to manage this patient. So the regulation, bought, regulate, regulate, the, the regulations that you're under with that organization you were talking yep, about. Yep, so this JACO. No, not, not, not yep. JACO, the, you're, the other one. The BSAS. Right, yep. BSAS. So under their regulation yep. that you're, you're working under, yep. are there certain specific patients that you cannot take? So I, to better answer that question, um, I don't know if JACO would necessarily, I mean, if um, BSAS would necessarily uh, set those standards, but as a substance use disorder treatment center, we cannot manage mental health. Um, so we're so, talking about bipolar, schizophrenia? Correct. Okay, versus depression, anxiety. Correct. Right? Okay. Correct. In so, the in, okay. I'm sorry, in the medications that are being given out, Yep. Is that done by the nursing staff themselves? Yes. Or are the patients, are they self? No, there'll be a nursing station. That handles the medications. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. There was a woman in the back. Hi. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, thank you um, to Process Recovery Center. Um, it was extremely educational um, because it has crippled my life hearing about all um, through the lawyer sheets and everything but um to the owner um i know this is shocking i own some properties too um i need to i would like to ask if you're ever open to rezoning the property i know that you keep referring it as i can only fit this and this into that spot but i was curious if you would ever be re um be open to with neighborhood support of rezoning it to maybe um, in the future um, condos or townhouses. Um, I, I'm open to a lot of things. I guess the short answer though, and sort of to repeat what I said earlier, I don't think that's a great fit for this particular building in that 
it, it's already pretty well laid out for what it is, and I think it meets a need. Um, so I'm not. It's not that I'm not open to it being rezoned, but I think it. Um, I think it's pretty good for something as it was designed to be a nursing home, um, and I think it's pretty good for this, which is a somewhat similar usage uh, for this particular facility as proposed. So. Um, so in theory, I'm open to it. I just I'm not sure that it would be the best, highest, and best use for the building or for the, um, you know, ultimately for what what I'd like to see happen to it or, or what would be best for the, uh, for for the, the town or, or the neighbors. All right. Thank you. More questions? Right up. <coughs> Hi, Caitlin Kaler. Uh, live in Lindsay Lane. Um, is there any restrictions on? like sexual offenders being allowed in the property under your recovery center like in terms of people coming and going it's it's nice to know if they are allowed if that screening happens so again going back to um the standards up front so during the pre-assessment and i will have to get back to you on the best concrete answer for that because i wouldn't i would need to be able to give you the answer i'd want to hear which is there are certain questions that BSAS requires us to ask, and I, I truly believe that that is one of them. I know one of them is arson, um, if they've had a, have, had a crime on arson, and I also believe in addition to that question is that question. Um, but I would like to get you a factual answer. Thank you. And to follow up on that though, would you I, Excuse me, ma'am, please do not interrupt. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on her question. I, I understand that we have 20 minutes. Check to verify no. if it's just self report. I, I understand that. Please hold your question. Julie, can we have the gentleman right over here? You can steal her question. Just try to spread it out here. Just in regards to town officials, can, I live right across the street from the facility. Can you tell me what type of impact it will have on my property values? <laughs> we don't have the town assessor here this evening. Um, and that's not a question that we would be able to answer. Uh, are there additional questions? Amy? Um, what type of. Um, thank you. Again, I was elected by a group, and I have all these questions that I'm trying to run through to make sure I have all of them. Um, what type of signage would be um, outside the building? So passers-by understand what that building is for. That's a tricky one. I mean, we have to get approval by the town, to be honest, for any signage, but there would be a sign saying the process recovery center or some signifying w what the use is. Even if it was on the door. Yeah, potentially it could be on the door. I mean, we're, we're open to working with the neighborhood on that, if you guys had preferences about that. Um, we don't get clients because they're walking down the street. Yeah, I think so to I, us. I, I can't, I, I'm not in a butter. I'm not yeah. even on the same street, but I think that I've heard from a lot of people that there's concern about um, the image of it. And okay. um, I think there is a desire to kind of, like you said, you don't, you're not gonna be getting people walking in the door. You're not gonna be eating foot yeah. traffic. So I think that there is a desire to keep this more discreet okay. if it was to move forward in this direction. We'd be more than open to... to All right. Thank you. Uh, the woman here by the door. I just wanted a clarification. Um, you had said when they were talking about uh, you know, people um, possibly walking out at different times. You said the doors were never locked. That it was... Is that true? Yeah, you legally can't lock them in it's not it's not a section 35 so so the doors are always open mm -hmm. for people to walk out mm -hmm. and you I mean although you say you know you don't have a high um, rate and, of yeah. people leaving yeah. but you said also that you can't prevent them from doing so it. typically when somebody's in treatment and they're gearing up to leave treatment there's a lot of red flags so typically that also means that they're being more supported so whether that's with uh one staff member or two staff members if somebody's at risk of leaving it's not it's not like a secret they don't just bust out the door um it's usually worked up to that um so in saying that i mean i know for us and what we do in our practice today 
if I have somebody at risk of leaving treatment, I mean, I'm I'm the first one to call their parents. Like that's just a, a practice that I've been in. Um, so usually I already have the family on the phone. Um, and that can mean anything from a parent to a girlfriend to a child. Um, and so it's not this, I feel like we're getting into this image of somebody just busting down the door and running down the street. I'm just thinking of someone just Safety. walking out the door. Yeah. And, and just, you know, I mean, if you have four, if you have four staff, if there's mm -hmm. one staff member to eight people, and you have how many people, you don't even know how many people you'll have in the facility. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if, if you've got a, some couple of people that like, you know, I want to go outside in the patio and have a smoke, you know, so you get, well, who's going to go out with them? Or they, do they go out? Does someone always have to be with them? And then you have someone else who's having difficulty. Now you have somebody with that person, and your staff is being slowly broken apart, and you still have a lot of people, and if someone, you know, I think I can better answer your question. So if there's an, when I say that there's an unlocked door, that doesn't mean every single door in the building is unlocked. Um, that means that they have the freedom to leave. So I, there are a number of doors on that building. Um, so unless, if there was a, a fire exit door that needed to remain unlocked for whatever reasons, an alarm would go off. Um, and those doors, they, so when I say unlocked, I mean the front door is open to them. And that is monitored by staff. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Woman here? She is getting my Get it from the aisle. Hi, so I have two very quick questions. Um, First off, so what if someone does want to AMA in the middle of the night? You'd said the train thing, but obviously they're not running in the night. So what would be the process or procedure for that? Uh, to kind of piggyback off what I was saying, typically when somebody is AMAing, um, it's kind of our, it's in the works. Um, it's, I mean, I, I'd be, I, it's never happened, but let's say it does. Let's say somebody wakes up at 2 a.m. and they're like, I'm getting out of here. Um, so the staff is accountable to be staff, to staff the patient. So what that means is a number of different things, that there's eyes on these people 24 hours a day. Um, so if somebody was to just wake up out of their bed and say, I'm leaving, um, within the five minutes that they pack their stuff, usually they want to be talked out of it. I will, I will say that. There's an element there where they do. So I mean, what I, what I would like to put in place as a protocol is that the family is contacted immediately, which brings another element uh, for a number of different reasons. If we just thought that somebody was gonna put the neighborhood at risk and they, and they just left our facility, I think when we had the initial meeting with the town, there was a lot of talk about the support systems that you guys already have in place for people that are affected by addiction. I think it was, I, I could be mistaken, but it was somebody that uh, worked at the police station. And so I would be more than happy to put a system in place when those instances do come up and how we could manage them. Um, it's not something that would happen on a regular basis, but we could absolutely put something in place it, should that happen, should we proceed with you know, the, the whole thing. Thank you. And is there Thank a board you. check process? For who? For the residents? For every yeah, for the staff, everybody. the residents. Yeah. So you said you worked in healthcare? So you know that's illegal, right, for patients to get quarry checks? So then you're saying that level one, twos, and threes could be admitted. Worst case scenario, they could AMA, and they're across the street from the library with like a million little children during story time. So, so, so that, that is different. Se sex, uh, registered sex offenders, they can ask that question. They can make a determination as to whether or not someone's a registered sex offender. And, 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 and I believe they can refuse admission also to them. They're not a protected no. class. But you and verify it, because it's not just self-report. Well, if it's... If it, they're either a registered sex offender or they're not, and they can you can look that up by their name, I believe, anywhere. But do you only level three? You have to ask the police department for ones and twos. They then they only. I, I'm not sure about that. Whether they, All right, I, so that I do not know. I I think. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I think perhaps this is one of the questions that we so can continue as far as um, conversations. Me, what the, sure. Say something. We're assuming that everybody that becomes addicted to a drug is a, is is a, no. you know what I mean? So I know it just no, sounds like it a little all bit. All right. Can we can we pause here? I understand. But that can happen if somebody went to the doctor to the doc a uh, doctor's visit across from there. 
All right, everyone, please, let's let's break it down. I understand the quarry subject is a sensitive one, and it is something that we can engage with further. We are down to the last 10 minutes. Are there additional questions? Yes, the woman in the back here. Well, hold on just for a moment until the microphone reaches you. Thank you. I was a little bit late to, um, to this. Thank you for, for your time. I appreciate it. But it's just that the gentleman, I don't know your name, at the very end. Justin. Justin. Um, you did say that uh, you were very concerned about the safety of the children. Yep. And that's really, we are too, whatever. So I just put to you, why, why would you think that that type of facility would be this is the this is the appropriate place to put that type of facility because I really think that people are recovering and that they need space as well plus also as well like how about like having more more grounds around so they can get out of the building as well and walk around I'm just putting it to you just to take to really think about that just think about that because I know you don't live around here probably around around it go out here but the, by putting it, it's um, by putting a facility like that here, you're already people are stressed out completely, and they're already like you know you have people going to bed like my friend over there Beth like <coughs> go going to bed like do we know what something's going to happen during the night? We all have to do you know what I mean like it's just I those little it. things and and it builds and it builds and we have older people here as well, you know so it's just I think you really really need to think about what goes in there and I think a nursing home would be great. We, that would be perfect. I'm just saying. Uh, she's, she's behind you. Thank you. It's, if I'm being honest, it's not easy to find buildings that are retrofitted to meet the specs, and that one does. I, I'm being honest with you, that is just that, that's why we consider it. Yeah. I've, been, I've been looking no, for years. No, that's the specs. I understand. Yes. I understand. All right. No, excuse me. Ma'am, thank you for the question. We have, we have 10 minutes left, and there are still other people. Ma'am, please hand the microphone back. Please, uh, no, ma'am, there are still other people who would like to ask questions. Ma'am, please hand the microphone back. Thank you. Of course. Hi. Um, thank you for coming to help clear up some of these questions that we have, because this is really very important for our neighborhoods. But I was just wondering, is this facility going to be for both male and female, or is it going to be restricted to one or the other? It's going to be male and female. Male and female. Correct. And that could create some problems. So there'll be different floors. Oh, different floors. Yep. Okay. And and double the staff as a result too. Just. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions. Uh, while we're there, gentleman in the corner. So can I just ask the town what is the timeline for issuing the occupancy permit? Chris? Exact date or, you know, range? There's no exact date. Range? Uh, I, I couldn't, I honestly couldn't say. Um, we need to be sure that we have all the information that we've asked for from the applicant, uh, and that remains still in process, so I can't, I can't say. What's typical? <laughs> on a use that's allowed by right, uh, clearly under the zoning bylaw, that would happen in a, a week or two. Um, so this is gonna this this is taken and I think this is taken longer than that certainly and will take a little bit longer than that. But I but I couldn't say. Um, I, I don't I can't say for sure. I got ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Julie, this gentleman here in the middle. Hi. Um, everybody's questions have been about the patients. My biggest concern is what kind of people come into the neighborhood that might want to get those people out of recovery, out of the treatment center? What is your security? Like, they might have a friend in there that, and the friend says, hey, drop something off in the bushes, I'll pick it up later. Because you mentioned that you have um, sweeps and found drugs in the treatment center. Mm -hmm. So what kind of security do you guys have that is going to be on the perimeter, as well as the traffic up and down on potential um, bad influences. Uh, to be honest, at our facility now, we don't have a perimeter 
I'm, I'm just I, yeah I'm just being you know I'm being honest right. as it stands currently at our facility now we don't have a perimeter we have an alarm system and, and everything else but we don't have perimeter sweeps or cameras not that we couldn't you know look into that because we definitely could and it's not something that we're against and I understand the concern and it's legitimate it's not an illegitimate concern it's definitely leg legitimate um, so I don't have an answer for you I definitely would be open to you know addressing it what kind of if it's a concern for the neighborhood I mean we're not security personnel do you have in your current facility now? we don't have security personnel we have so yeah, staffing staff. Okay, yeah. Are they trained in? I mean, I'm actually, I don't want to put guns here, but it's. Everyone else. How, how would they handle it? They just call the police if they see somebody outside, and that's going to put a burden on our police if we have that, that kind of. As well as the police always coming by with their lights flashing by the library. That's going to yeah. be another issue. I mean, our experience now is that, that that's not, it's, it's, it's a rare case that something like that happens. So again, I can't guarantee it would never happen, but I, I think it's, it's more fear than legitimate. All right, we, we have time for one more question, and then we will discuss next steps. Um, woman here in the middle. I thought you had said earlier that they should, they, patients don't have visitors. Is that That's, true that they don't? No, that is correct. A visit, patients do not have visitors, could I guarantee? And they're not really even allowed out of the building. When we talk about a smoking area, that's another thing that like, we're definitely considering, what that looks like, where it looks like, having a box <laughs> or a porch or something that is least intrusive, and we don't want them just walking outside and being able to walk away. That is not something that, that <coughs> we're going to do. So they don't have visitors, you're correct. Does that stop somebody? I mean, so to address your concern, if someone was leaving outside around going through the bushes of a resident, they would probably be discharged as a result of that because they're not allowed to just leave the building. So, and when we talk about a smoking area, it is something that we're considering with porches and other things. What's that looks like having a secured location for smoking? Thank you. All right, um, we are approaching time. I would like to thank everyone for coming this evening. As far as next steps, we do have two residents who are acting as representatives for the immediate neighborhood. Um, may, I, may I announce you? Would you like to stand and take a wave? All right. Um, Amy, Kathleen, um, if you'd like to join the conversation from a resident perspective, I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, myself and Mark Doxer from the select board, um, he's here at the front, would welcome additional comments. We do intend to pursue ongoing conversations um, both with the um, owner uh, in regards to the occupancy permit um, as well as the operator of the facility. So if you have additional concerns, please do, please do reach out with us. This isn't the end of the discussion. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.